some champions only have a few lines of lore written under their bio. Others keep getting more and more plot twists to their story. And one of these champions is the Fraliordian fan favorite, Sejuani. Besides her bio, her story was also expanded in the Ash comic. And somewhat recently, her lore was pushed forward with the story Silence for the Damned where Udyr helped Sejuani get temporarily allied with the Volibear and the Ursine. As a fun fact, in the same story, it was revealed that Udyr is Sejuani's father, even though Sejuani herself has no idea. What's also interesting is that there was a short part where the story tried to explain to the readers everything Sejuani went through, how she fought ice worms alone, how in the darkness she fought trolls blind, but it also mentioned how Sejuani tied her hair into a death knot many times before battles. Now, at the time, this mention of a Death Knot was just a random world-building detail. But last week, Sejuani actually got an entire new story simply called a Death Knot, which gave us a chance to learn what is the symbology behind Sejuani tying her hair. And so, without further ado, here's that story. The story begins with Sejuani cutting down a tree, which she would use to build a raft. She was used to the harsh cold climate of the Freljord, so normally this was an easy job. But now, Sejuani was in the south, where she wasn't used to the heat. Although she had only a hundred reavers by her side, their cheers and roars still echoed of the hills. They didn't care that they were being loud. The southern enemies already gathered up an army, and they were only half a day of marching behind them. On top of that, Sejuani was well aware that they were being watched by the enemy scouts. Sejuani's main army was currently in the north. Since it was summer, survival was easier in the Freljord, and so the Freljordians were busy herding, fishing and hunting. But at the same time, every now and then, Sejuani formed a small war party, and she marched around the Damasian borders, destroying towns, burning crops and wrecking keeps. Her plan was to wait for winter while doing this. Then, with the right opportunity, Sejuani and her Winter's Claw would have an easy time smashing through the weakened borders. And that's why Sejuani was in the south now. She was returning from one such expedition. Things got a bit more complicated when Scar Maiden Gjelk told Sejuani that the enemy gathered around a river which the Winter's Claw used to travel around. Sejuani wanted to see it with her own eyes. And so the two jumped on their mounts, which for the Winter's Claw were the Druvask boars, and they rode down the hillside. There, just 300 paces away, right next to a waterfall, Sejuani witnessed the Masian skirmishers, with a few hundred archers and spearmen walking out of a forest. The Damasians even noticed the two Freljordian women on their boars, but they ignored them, and they continued on their path. Then a horn sounded, and Sejuani knew well. This meant that the main force of the enemy army had arrived. And indeed, when Sejuani turned, she could see their glimmering armor on the hilltops behind them. It was clear what the Damasians were planning. If Sejuani tried to cross the river on rafts, the enemy archers would cut their force in half, and those who would survive would be held back by the spearmen, until the main Damasian army had time to catch up with them. Bitter and full of rage, Sejuani kicked her giant boar Bristle to quickly return to the rest of their group. Most of her warriors were already spotted by the enemy forces, and were preparing to flee along the river's edge, but they were struck by fear when they learned what was happening. They did not fear battle, but they did fear the Damasian trap. When Sejuani got back to her group, she announced that they couldn't stand against the army that was coming down from the hills. And at the same time, soon the enemy will send riders to block off any escape along the riverside. So their only option was to cross now. With that command, Sejuani took a small piece of wood wrapped in leather and placed it in her mouth. Then she uncoiled her great flail, called Winter's Wrath. Each link of the weapon's chain was as large as a man's hand, and at its end hung a massive shard of true ice, the largest most had ever seen. Misty vapor rose from its magical cold. Sejuani bit down onto the piece of wood in her mouth to resist the pain of the weapon's magic, because even though true ice was powerful, wielding it had a cost. And there was no denying that Sejuani was now in agony, as her tears froze like diamonds on her cheek. Yet, when her warriors looked at her, they didn't see pain. They saw rage in her eyes. After that, Sejuani spun her weapon around and crashed it into the water, which formed a small frozen bridge. Unfortunately, the bridge quickly broke apart in the warm currents. It definitely wasn't strong enough to hold her entire war party. Then, a few arrows started to fall from the other side of the river. 
It was the Damasian archers testing their range. Sejuani then put away her weapon, spat out the piece of wood and she removed her helmet. Then she unwrapped a piece of wolf guts which she had on her wrist. Seeing this simple act made her men roar in approval. And soon a barking chant began. Her warriors were no longer afraid. They knew they were witnessing something special. Sejuani was making the most sacred oath of her people. She was tying a death knot. As she uncoiled her braids, she ran the wolf guts through her hair. She wondered how many times she had taken a death oath. A dozen or perhaps more. It was certainly the most out of any warriors known. And she even wondered if today would be the day she would finally fall. Arrows began to hit the shore around her as she bound the knot. A few of her warriors tried to fire back, but the wind was against them. Then Sejuani started her speech. I am Sejuani, war mother of the Winter's Claw. I am the Winter's Wrath. I am the flail of the northern winds. Even in death I will hold the riverbank until you safely cross. This is my oath. I see the wolf and my fate is tied. Her warriors cheered, with many having their eyes wet with emotion. For Sejuani just swore to save their lives, even at the cost of her own. She did not need to give them any further orders. They all readied their weapons and climbed onto the rafts. They would cross as quickly as possible and try to come back in time to save her. Sejuani then placed the piece of wood back in her mouth and she picked up Winter's Wrath again. She ran her fingers through the hair on Bristle's back. The boar didn't need an oath or words to understand what she meant to do. So once again, exhausted, in pain and sweating from the heat, Sejuani crashed her weapon into the water and an icy bridge formed up. As Bristle charged forward, Sejuani held her shield high to block the incoming cloud of arrows. Still, a few stabbed her shoulders and thighs and dozens pierced Bristle's hide. They were barely halfway across the river when the bridge collapsed and they both ended up in the water. Bristle struggled, desperately trying to hold them above the surface. But more arrows rained down and the shore was too far away. All Sejuani saw now was the black from the bolts and the red from Bristle's blood. The great beast was screaming now, with a sound like a thunderstorm and a baby wailing. Bristle sputtered and without thinking, Sejuani leaned forward to protect the beast's body with her own. She even used her shield to cover its face and ease its suffering. That was the moment Sejuani thought, Perhaps their death would come today. Suddenly, Bristle found his footing in the shallows. And instead of drowning, the great beast started striding onto the riverbank. With the enemies in front of them now, Sejuani stood in her saddle and swung her flail, releasing an explosion of ice that cut apart a dozen unarmored archers. Bristle even managed to gore two of them himself. The rest of the archers ran away to hide behind the spearmen and get ready for another volley of arrows. But Sejuani grinned because she knew the archers already missed their opportunity. She looked back to see her own warriors crossing, untouched by the barrage she had just survived. Sejuani did not know if this would be her final day, but she had not failed her oath or her people. And that was all that mattered. And surprisingly, this is it for the story. I think this is the first story where we can't even call the ending a cliffhanger. This is straight up a drop into abyss. Obviously, I believe that Sejuani will survive somehow. But how it happens is what's interesting. She could just hold her ground long enough for her people to come back for her, which is what she was hoping for. Or perhaps this is where her allegiance with the Volibear comes through. There is the tiny chance that maybe the Primal God itself would save her. But the most likely outcome, and perhaps the coolest outcome, would be if the Demacians don't kill her, but they capture her instead. Knowing that Silas is now in Freljord and he's trying to convince Freljordians to help him destroy the Demacian government, this could end up in a situation where the Demacians might try to trade Sejuani for Silas. Just thinking about this makes me excited about the possible stabbing in the back. The Freljordians don't even care about Silas, so obviously they would double cross him to get Sejuani back. So if you ask me, this is just dripping with plot twisty opportunities. And it would be a cool way to connect Sejuani to Silas's story too. Silas already has an incredible story arc related to many different champions. So the more characters you connect to him, the better links there are between the stories of Demacia and Freljord. With that said, there are some exceptions though. We don't have to connect every champion to Silas. <laughs>
You don't want to be like this. This is disgusting. This is awful in every way. If I could kill it, I would. But I legally can't. But I've considered it.